Hello, and welcome to Higher Voltage. Our podcast explores the ins and outs of higher education marketing and touches on all aspects of the business of higher education. My name is Heather Dotchell. I'm a Philadelphia-based marketing and communication professional who most recently led the Marcom divisions at two area colleges. I'm excited to say that Terry Flannery, higher ed wonk herself, is here today to talk about her new book, How to Market a University. Terry, welcome to Higher Voltage. Thank you. I'm ready to bolt. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, can you start out by giving our community a, a quick summary of your professional background? Sure. I'm a higher ed leader with 35 years of experience in the sector. I haven't worked in any other environment but higher ed, and I have experience in different um, areas of higher ed administration. So I started out in student affairs. I moved to admissions. And uh, there I had the first opportunity to learn more about marketing, where it was taking hold sooner than in other parts of the college and university environment. And that's where I kind of got my calling. So I've been a higher ed marketer since 1997. And I've worked at um, now three institutions where I'm the chief um, marketing officer, University of Maryland. Um, was my alma mater in my first role, American University in Washington, D.C. And then recently I joined Stony Brook University as their interim vice president for marketing communications in New York. Um, so three institutions with very different marketing um, challenges and opportunities, but great fun all along. Wonderful. Thank you. Before we get into the meat of the episode, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you that Higher Voltage is brought to you by Salesforce. Today's higher ed marketers are faced with new challenges and must expand beyond their traditional tactics to engage with constituents. Learn how Salesforce empowers institutions of all sizes to unify first-party data, build and measure targeted campaigns, and deliver personalized messaging across channels. Visit salesforce.org to learn more about how Salesforce can help your institution meet its goals. The title, How to Market a University, is simple and totally accurate. It's essentially a how-to manual that not only supplies immensely helpful advice, experience, and tools for all of us, but it also does so in a way that should be accessible to your president, your board, your fellow higher ed executives. I have to say, I was trying to skim through it in time for the episode, and I found that I could not skim it. I kept getting pulled in. <laughs> <laughs> it was Yay. just rang true. Um, it was so well written with the flow that it was very easy to slip from skimming mode and go into deep reading. And then at some point I just stopped skimming and said, okay, everything's going on hold and I'm going to sit down and read ah, this. I got you. Um, <laughs> you did. But, you know, it's um, really funny though, Heather, though, is that even though I know it is an important work for CMOs, I wrote this book for presidents, provosts, and boards of trustees. So it's really written in a in a way that is accessible to them. It's not filled with marketing lingo. Um, it's designed to help those leaders understand the value and true purpose of marketing. But it's got some tools in it to connect um, those leaders with their CMOs. And so every chapter has a set of discussion questions that I encourage folks to talk with their leaders about. Yeah, it's definitely going to be on my uh, my list of, of handing it over to, to my president at every position I might be in and perhaps positions that I'm not that I think it could just be useful for them. <laughs> <laughs> so in the introduction, you talk a bit about the, um, the motivation behind the book, the process of writing this book. You actually left your position at American University to devote yourself to its writing, yes? Yes, after 11 years in the role, and that was hard. But most of us know that um, our day jobs are very unpredictable, even more so <laughs> since I uh, stepped off this cliff to write the book. Um, and, you know, I was trying to do it for about six months just in my own time. And there was never my own time. So in order to really do it, I decided to do sort of a self-funded sabbatical. Um, and it took about six months to write the manuscript and then, you know, into um, editing and all the other stuff that goes on afterwards. You mentioned in it you received advice that a good way to approach it would be to um, interview and converse with a few experts um, mm -hmm. in the particular chapter topic and then use those transcripts. I thought that was genius. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you find yourself using that technique? I did. So this is an idea. I, I polled all my faculty friends at American before I started writing to say, how do you do this well? And they gave me all kinds of tips. Um, but one came from Jim Thurber, who is a prolific scholar and someone who's written, I don't know, a multi he's at the top of his field in terms of presidential and congressional studies, written multiple books. And he said, 
he's an, he's an extrovert like I am. And he said, you know, this is a solitary exercise. So one way that you can make it less so that it will also help you write the book is to write an outline for your book, do a paragraph for each chapter about what you want to cover. And for each chapter, send that to someone who you think is an expert that w- that you'd be able to have a chat with and send it to them in advance, set up a meeting for an hour, record it. And Uh, ask about what's missing, ask for examples, see if their thinking is aligned with yours or not and why. He said, when you're finished and you've recorded that, the chapter will virtually write itself. And he was absolutely right. But it also gave me the benefit of talking to some of our our greatest thought leaders in the field um, and some presidents who've been through this work from their perspective. So it really gave me opportunities to have it not be a, a solitary experience, but also to bring in some really good thought leadership from elsewhere. I loved that. My path through marketing and comms, since we all have different ones, is publications and writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when I was going through the introduction, that that really jumped out at me. And I thought, oh, that's a fantastic way to approach it. So I wanted to to mention that. I recommend it, yep. Uh, So you write at the beginning, uh, I have a a quote here, the pressures to stand out, successfully compete, and meet an institution's goals have never been more acute. In a period of declining public support, a shrinking pipeline of traditional college-bound students, and a steady rise in tuition and discount rates, and in the wake of a devastating global pandemic that is likely to permanently alter the higher education landscape for years to come, leaders are under intense pressure to ensure steady or growing enrollments, cultivate greater philanthropic support, grow research funding, and diversify revenue streams, all while strengthening institutional reputation. Uh, (laughs) This is chilling. (laughs) Filling it through. (laughs) Um, But it does really highlight how lockstep institutional strategy and marketing strategy Mm -hmm. must be in order to succeed. About what percentage of university leadership understands this, do you think? (laughs) Um, I'm not sure I know a percentage, but I would say whatever it is, it's on the rise. And even for those leaders who don't understand this, they're curious about it now, or they are inclined almost in terms of a burning platform, if you've heard that term before, to jump off and find out more about this work because um, they're in positions that the incentives have never been greater. Um, and some of the forces that you mentioned in that quote, you know, are really challenging them to look for tools or options or approaches that they haven't in the past. So one of the essential premises of the book for this audience is marketing strategy is institutional strategy. And there are three presidents that I talked to that I highlight in the book that were going through the process of developing their strategic plan and their brand strategy at the same time who understood that that was the case. They should be informed by the same research, um, and they should be aligned closely. Uh, They don't always have to be done in in tandem. Sometimes the circumstances don't allow for that to happen, but clearly leaders are beginning to see the value. And that's certainly a new phenomenon. When I started in this work, we couldn't even say the M word. (laughs) And we weren't allowed to do the brand research before the strategic plan because God forbid we'd want to have customers telling us what we should be teaching students. God forbid, (laughs) that's all changing. So I know it's on the rise, even if it's not yet understood or recognized widely. So we loved seeing Angela Pollock's work cited extensively. She actually was on Higher Voltage uh, right before the holidays talking about um, the importance of having the CMO at the leadership table. So let's elaborate a little bit on that in light of your book and explore how to begin talking about marketing's purpose, resources, and measurement Mm -hmm. with institutional Mm -hmm. leadership. Yeah, well, Angela, I should just mention, was my thought partner um, on this book. Really, really important. And she's one of the rock stars in higher education marketing. So an important voice. And her research looked at how um, successful CMOs operate and what makes them successful. At least that's my sense of her work. Um, And she looked at forces that um, support that success, both uh, bureaucratic and network power, which I would kind of translate as formal and informal power. So um, you can think about walking into a role to see what the structure is going to allow in terms of formal power and try to choose wisely is what I would say. Choose something that you think fits with what you expect, what you want, but that includes the support from the top, the president in particular, who's vocal and support about the importance of this work, willing to fund it, um, gives you a title and a seat at the leadership 
table as member of the cabinet, which is happening in more than half the cases at our institutions across the country right now, um, according to some case data. Um, so, you know, the opportunities in many cases start to structure that formal power. But really the secret sauce, and I think Angela's dissertation demonstrated this well, is in the work that goes on, on the informal side. And so marketing leaders who are transformational leaders, they exhibit transformational leadership capabilities, not transactional, are those that really develop the kind of relationships and influence that goes well beyond your formal portfolio, reporting structure, any of those kinds of things. Um, and that's really key. Um, so thinking about like walking in the door, what do you have available and then what else can you cultivate is going to be really important. In instances where you don't have those discussions happening yet, and I know some people do, they're a director of marketing or an executive director or something that's not got them there yet. I think I would say look across and look up. Who are your colleagues that you could have conversations with about this work and who are you reporting to that could benefit from some more thinking about this? And sure, you could give them the book <laughs> and have some conversations about this, but really I would say think about things like bring the data. We have a unique position in our institutions where we have data that crosses many different functions and many different audiences. And we have this unbelievable perspective about the stakeholder audiences that's about as wide as it comes. Maybe only the president has a similarly wide view in that regard. If you can bring data about those audiences to the table about an important decision and not say, let me in, you sh I should be part of this, but something to offer that might help us think about this you're usually gonna be able to demonstrate some value that begins to unlock the keys to the kingdom, right? So then people start to see, hmm, this person has a perspective and some intelligence that could really help us with our thinking about our strategy, our position, our pricing, our service, our program. Um, and that maybe is the place to start if you don't have it yet, and then build on that. So quite related to that, you provided a great deal of guidance about unit structuring, which I'd like to talk a bit about, but in a similar vein, um, you talked about marketing task force working groups and steering committees um, as essential to shaping vision, but also as having very separate roles. Can you highlight the differences in particular usefulness of each group for those who might not work with these types of partner groups already? I know in my institutions, we had one or not the other or two mm -hmm. or maybe something called by another name. Can you talk a little bit more about the structures that you work sure. with? Yep. So I think the, the, the structures that you're talking about are tools for integrating that compensate for things that aren't part of the formal structure. That's how they're presented in the book. So in many instances, we are limited or hindered in some ways by our decentralized functions of marketing and communications across our campuses. And the bigger you are, the more complex you are, the more you are a research university, the decentralization is just wild. At a small, small institution, it's not quite so egregious. But even in those instances, you, you may not have the kind of input or influence or buy-in you need to be able to move forward successfully in higher ed marketing. We work in an environment with shared governance that we can fail really easily if we move too quickly without bringing our um, internal and even our external audiences along with us on this ride, on this journey. So if your structure has people and units be they communicators or the people that those folks are reporting to who could make your program more successful or who could upend what you're trying to achieve in terms of your primary responsibilities, then these structures are ways to help you compensate for that and to help integrate. So something like a marketing task force that I talk about is a group that becomes your most expert participants and really the recommenders to the decision makers about the key decisions in your marketing program. So if you're doing a brand study, they can help you identify what the key questions are that should be studied, how to ask them, which audiences, how to execute. And they're not down the line marketing people in, in such a task force. They should represent kind of the power users of the brand across the institution. And then some constituency representatives. Um, at American, we had at least two faculty members, one with expertise in marketing from the business school and one from the School of Communications that was an expert in market research. And so their expertise contributed, but they were also providing a faculty perspective. We had an undergrad and a grad student as part of that program. So task force is the kind of thing that can help you think about 
what should be the approach to the brand research? How do we make meaning of these findings for our community? How do the findings shape recommendations for a brand strategy? What should the expression of our brand concept be based on those recommendations? Those are all kind of milestones in this process that we talk about in the book that are really representative and kind of not all the way high level, but fairly informed and influential group can help guide the major decisions and recommend to the cabinet decisions key decisions that they can then make. And they're so involved in the participation along the way, they become advocates for the process. They have buy-in. So they've been on the journey in a really informed way. Um, Something like a working group, in my thinking, is a group of people who have the same kind of work, but don't report to the same boss, for lack of a better word. So you might take all your people that do media relations work or strategic communications and have form a working group where you're establishing your leadership authority and influence by gathering them. You're the convener um, and you have your staff there, but all the rest of them there too. And you provide professional development and opportunities to engage or collaborate on things that everyone would benefit from. Or maybe you make decisions on a tool together um, that makes all of their work easier. So a working group helps bring people with similar professional responsibilities together, even when their day-to-day jobs wouldn't. And then a steering committee for me is more along the lines of an ongoing group of people at a fairly high level who are representing shared ownership of something that crosses functions. And an example I give in the book is web governance. So that many times crosses multiple different areas of responsibility, including technology, including marketing communications, but also has really key important stakeholders in the academic units and the administrative units. So thinking about a group in an ongoing way that's developing web policy, um, looking at compliance and enforcement, developing and scanning an enterprise approach to how do we keep the site, you know, up to date? How do we manage the content? All those kinds of things. So that's how I divide up those three things. And they all involve a great deal of consultation and meeting (laughs) in order to keep our colleagues with us. Um, And you you also do make it very evident in the book that buy-in from the community leadership needs to occur early in the process Mm -hmm. of these brand discoveries or refinement processes. Um, You have a great example of a conversation with a provost about making sure that faculty ambition was included in the messaging, that seemed to end very well. Um, But do you have an example of learning this the hard way that you can share? (laughs) You know, there, there are always instances where things don't go exactly like you want them to go, but I've been fortunate to avoid any real disasters. Um, And it's because it's inherent in my being professionally raised in higher education that I'm a creature of shared governance and consultation and collaboration. So I know that that's really important. I think people who come from other environments that get a little frustrated with the pace of that um, may shortchange that. It gets them in more trouble usually. (laughs) Um, You know, I I think I tell the story where um, at, at American, when we had a brand concept recommended and chosen and even creative tested, but we hadn't rolled it out yet, we took a summer to consult in small groups, um, 35 luncheons and teas. I I joked that I gained 10 pounds, but a lot of brand support in the process (laughs) Um, with faculty and staff in small groups, mainly faculty. And we walked them through all the research and they want you know, they're scholars, they understand research, walked them through all the research and the resulting findings and the requirements that were informed by those findings and then the concept. And then we said, how would you see yourself using this? How can we make this even more effective? And that process gave them some education about what this is really about. It helped establish sort of what this thing is designed to do. It got us out of the discussions of, I don't like that color. I don't like that typeface. I don't like marketing. It's commercial. And brought it right to their work in a relevant way. And then we were asking them to make it better. So sure, you're going to hear things in there where some people want to derail it and say horrible things. But guess what? You get to hear what the gadflies are going to say about it before you actually roll it out. It's great intelligence, right? And you're gonna know who's the obstructionist or the person who's gonna have concerns. If you can't win them over, you at least know what they're gonna say. Um, and certainly I've had my share of people who've told me <laughs> what you know what they think about that. Um, so I would say those are not you know, going wrong, but it's, it's hard to hear this thing you've worked on so hard on isn't gonna be loved by everybody and you just gotta get over that. In the meantime, you also gain lots of advocates in a process like that, and they help make it better. They're actually thinking about it in a way that you could not because you have a different lived experience, a different professional background, 
all those kinds of things. So that helps you avoid that learning the hard way, I would say. I particularly enjoyed the uh, beating drum of market research um, and and especially the audience first perspective that you brought through out the book. Um, you relay a great anecdote about administrative leadership um, when presented with two options, always picking the opposite of what the student <laughs> perspective audience would. Um, has there been a time where you've been completely surprised as to what your research revealed students or donors or other prospective audiences preferred or wanted? Yeah, I think as I get older, I um, start to see that same pattern happening where I am more removed from the experience of a traditional life student. And it's a little humbling, I would have to say. That provost in that story said, why don't you just save money? We don't need to do any more creative testing. Just ask me which one I like and pick, take the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the you always learn things in the research. None of us, even the most experienced, is going to think of everything. It helps you your work become better. And so I guess a great example um, would be watching um, focus groups engage with the content and seeing how it influences them and uh, really listening. So, you know, with Fear the Turtle at University of Maryland, we could hear from faculty who really had kind of a bias that that came from an athletic rallying cry and it wasn't academically serious. But all the messages were about how the institution had grown as a public research university in terms of excellence. It was using the athletic rallying cry as a pivot move. And conversations like that had the opportunity to help us think about how are we gonna address that obstacle with an, a really important internal audience and how can we adjust this to make it better. Another example is at American University where we were doing the creative testing for uh, the Wonk campaign. And that was like unlocking the secrets to the universe about this campaign and how it worked. It was magical. So we're sitting in groups of uh, prospective students and just showing them the word Wonk on a board and said, what do you think of this word? And they said things like Wonk, Wonk. It sounds funny. Uh, Willy Wonka, you know, really didn't know what it was, but they didn't, they, their reaction wasn't good. And then we gave them the information that wonk is no spelled backwards. And you could literally see people of all, not just students, alumni, staff, faculty, sit back in their chairs and smile like, oh, that's pretty clever. Um, and uh, for a concept that's for a educational institution, they could see that relationship, they realized where did this come from? We actually gave them some stories about how Wonk emerged as no spelled backwards. Then we um, gave them a definition. You know, a Wonk is someone who's considered smart, passionate, focused, engaged, and ready to use their knowledge to affect meaningful change. And they're like, oh, that's American University. That's so American University. Then they started using it, you know, and doing examples of what kind of wonk they were or could be and how we could use it. It helped give us the roadmap for how to roll out the concept because it was going to have these challenges at the beginning that uh, needed to be addressed. So great opportunities to see how you can learn from those experiences. I love that. And I love that that is a campaign that's ownable. Um, we're talking a lot, I mean, we have for years, but I think the, the pandemic has accelerated things to such a point that we're talking about schools really, really needing to dig in and differentiate themselves um, and having messaging outside the norm, but that is very ownable for the institution with Americans' location and all of that. Wong makes a lot of sense. Fear the Turtle is is different and it's cheeky and and it, it you can't just throw any institution in there and right. have it work. Fear the Turtle, do I remember correctly, was that the second go-round for messaging from that campaign? It was. So it was the second expression of the brand concept or the brand platform. So the first one was Zoom and uh, it was a really good start for our very first brand expression at Maryland, but it had kind of a short shelf life. People got tired of it very quickly. It was a little gimmicky. And in the words of my president at the time, Dan Mote, who was a huge advocate for differentiation, very courageous guy, said this one, speaking of fear of the turtle, this one has legs. And he was right. You know, it lasted for more than a decade and is still the platforms there and expressed in fearless ideas. Now it's been modified in some ways, including after I left, but the um, notion of it, of it having some longevity is really important. That expression came from what people were trying to express with the mascot 
the Terrapin, which is a really unique and differentiated mascot. So right there, you start from a place. I, I just sort of say, look for places where you clear have clear differentiation in your identity, in your mission, in your position, in your location. What is it that you have a place to differentiate? And then ask whether that's relevant, meaningful to the audiences, and um, authentic to the institution where folks internally say, yeah, that's us. Um, and Fear the Turtle had all of that in it. It was designed to express quality, discovery, impact, and momentum, which were all requirements from our research about what we needed to do. But the personality of the institution came through in that expression. You know, really fierce determination in the people at, a, at the University of Maryland. Kind of scrappy, always moving forward, never looking backward. A, a turtle can't go backwards, actually. Um, and it was cheeky. Um, it took a little bit of the tortoise and the hare tail um, as sort of its inspiration. Um, and a terrapin is actually only about two inches long. And we did things to make it look ferocious and powerful. It roared like a lion and it stomped like an elephant and all kinds of really, as you said, cheeky things. So there was a bit of uh, don't take yourself too seriously in it, which was also very characteristic of the personality of the institution. So very much us. I appreciate the idea of sustainability, um, and I find it remarkable that you got basically a decade of mileage out of that yeah. at this point. How do you help the internal community to keep embracing messaging like that? Um, I know one of my challenges has always been saying to the various branches, you see our message every day, and this is why you're a little tired of it. Yeah. <laughs> and you need to put yourself in the external audience and realize they're not seeing this every day. They're seeing right. it once a week on their commute or, you know, when they pull up a, a website and an ad comes up or they, they hear, it's sporadic for them. It's not constant. So mm -hmm. what are some of the ways that, that you recommend having those conversations or encouraging um, our internal communities to, to stick with messaging and uh, campaigns that they might be a little tired of? Yeah. Well, I think uh, first choose a concept that's going to have some ability to flex and adapt and that gives you a, a better starting point for something that will last, right? Warn your task force or whatever advisory group that you're working with, that they're going to get tired of it and they're going to be hearing from their colleagues and students who are tired of it. They're going to get brand fatigue before it ever has a chance to do the job. And so setting that expectation and saying, we're going to need to uh, ward against that. And here's how we're going to do it with research. Because we need to see, based on the requirements that we were trying to address with this program, we need to see some needles move. And they don't move quickly. And we're talking about changing behaviors and perceptions of indig individuals in our audiences who we want to engage in some level of support for the institution, whether it's enrolling or giving or um, spending time or recommending any of those kinds of things, um, working at the place. So the requirements in your research that you address in your brand strategy become sort of the roadmap. Uh, Elizabeth Johnson calls it the insurance for your brand strategy that uh, you're going to measure over time. And you might, you know, I know we're going to talk about measurement. You might have some early indicators that something's getting recognized or picked up or recalled, but then you want to really over time, maybe over two, three years, start to see fundamental things change incrementally at first, awareness, favorability, loyalty, you know, the things that we're, we look to measure. That's going to take time. In the meantime, to get back to the answer to your question, you've got to be able to get the internal audiences to hang in there and put up with the fatigue. So have them on board, have them as advocates to talk about how we're going to measure when this thing is done doing its job. And until it does, we need to think about how to refresh, how, how to use it well, how to use it differently, in what ways can we uh, keep our own interest in it. But we're not going to make a decision about using this or not because we're tired of it. We're gonna make a decision based on data that says it's done about all that it can do and we need something else. All right, well, this seems an excellent time to talk about measurement. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the book do, uh, uh, doesn't just cover higher level um, marketing theory. You do cover tactics and measures and other grittier tactical takes. Um, we'll leave some of that for the book, but can you at least walk us through your short middle and long-term measurement parameters, uh, what we should be looking for at those stages? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this is one of the three things that leaders want to know about. 
um, related to marketing. They want to know how to organize, resource, and measure this stuff measure the effectiveness. So I break down um, the measures into short, middle, and long-term measures, thinking in terms of time, because this process isn't one that you'll see um, immediate substantive results that say, yes, this is all working in the right direction. Um, Short-term measures are about showing that what you have put into the marketplace is getting some pickup. It's getting recognized. Um, Maybe some early adoption Um, it is, uh, there is evidence that people are interested enough to engage with it a little bit. So if you've got digital strategies in your mix, those are the easiest ways to demonstrate pickup, engagement, et cetera. People are sharing things, um, people have clicked through, all those kinds of things early on. Early adoption, you might look at things like if you did t-shirts with the brand uh, expression on it and gave them out, are they being worn? You know, did they get picked up quickly and are they being worn around the institution? Are people proud of it? Um, Those are some ways um, to see early on. Uh, Midterm strategies have to do with what um, Sir David Bell at the University of Reading Reading called proxy measures. Um, He's the, the CEO of that institution in the UK. And he said, I can't tell you cause and effect that the brand strategy made attendance at our open house days better. They call them open days in the UK um, or had more applicants or better conversion rates. I can't tell you cause and effect, but I know the two are related. And here he's talking about behaviors. And if you think about what we're trying to do in marketing, we are really trying to change the perception of the brand in the minds of our audiences, right? Or reinforce it or elevate engagement with it. In many instances, that's changing a mindset. And so you are often not going to be able to measure how people's perceptions have changed right away. But you can see behavior start to change that really are reflecting that perception. It's the behaviors, the proxy measures that most of our leaders care about. And those should be moving in the right direction. They might be moving slowly. But if you're looking at yield rate for admissions for prospective students, if you um, had a low admit rate at AU when we started, it was Um, 19%, so one in five admitted students. Uh, It moved uh, through a process where over time, maybe over three years, it moved to one in three admitted students enrolling. Um, So something like that, that measures moving in the right direction. It's telling you this is working. If you're looking at long-term measures, then you're really looking at another take on the uh, brand research to see how awareness or favorability or loyalty um, or recall of the associations of the brand you're trying to lay in, how those are working. And those require more resources to do and more time. So you wouldn't want to do them, you know, it'd probably be early after two years, um, two, three years, definitely every three years makes a lot of sense and measuring over time, whether those long-term things have changed. You talked quite a bit, actually, about the dance between qualitative and quantitative research and and how to kind of balance them out and really take the time to to use them to their full potential in that first round of brand research. Uh, Based on that work, you said, you know, round two and round three might be easier because you already have your questions very um, formable and calculable. For Schools that have smaller amounts of resources um, that are really stretching, do you think it would be possible to um, create an initial set of strong research questions that you've gone through, you've taken the time and resources, and then administer part two and three via the the colleges or universities' internal resources uh, to follow up on that? I think it's possible. You know, I mentioned Elizabeth Johnson at Simpson Scarborough a minute ago. She says you can do research for any budget, you know, and we actually show there's a template there that shows kind of how you can um, expand or stretch depending on what kind of uh, budget you have, what kind of institution you have and how many audiences, those kinds of things. Um, I think the method should be driven by what you want to accomplish with the research. And then you can scale to how many people you include, how big are the samples, those kinds of things. The difference between qualitative and quantitative is that qualitative helps you describe something. And if you don't know how people describe your brand yet or describe your institution and its strengths and its weaknesses, et cetera, then you need some qualitative research to actually give you good um, quality input. You can get that from your internal audiences, but you're going to be biased in terms of what they see and not the external audiences. A 
quantitative study measures the magnitude of something. So you can see how much something is working, how big a problem is, why, what percentage of your audiences are aware of your institution, things like that. So they do different things. And you'd wanna think about, if you have small pot of resources, what's the least expensive way to meet the right need with the right method? And so you don't have to do it all at once. You can start small, but you need to start with what, you know, what your research purpose is and what you're trying to accomplish. You also, um, in that conversation, talk about that it's important when you are formulating this to not simply say, oh, we can go to institutional research and they can handle this for us. Why is that? Well, sometimes they can, um, but they have a portfolio of institutional research that makes it hard to get in, get this in the queue in a lot of instances. And their perspective might not be related to market research, which is a particular kind of institutional research that gets done. And, you know, if you work with someone who does this regularly, a, a firm or an individual, they already know how to form the questions in a way that's the science, really, uh, of uh, market research in our work. If you work with someone in institutional research whose expertise is assessment, they're not going to have familiarity with the same questions. They'll know all the methods, they'll get the analysis, they'll be a great partner in the process, but they might have some learning to do on actually the what's the state of the art in terms of the questioning or the method in our specific work. So finding a way to figure out how to get the best capacity, research capacity that you can afford um, that will get you the best combination of method and good good outcomes is important. So to everybody in the audience, there's your clip that you need to start convincing the rest of leadership that market research is a worthy investment. Mm-hmm. You have an entire chapter dedicated um, to hard numbers um, that have to do with marketing and comm, whether it's the budget or position allocation. Um, and I think that chapter will probably be in very heavy use uh, <laughs> by marketing and communications to reach uh, leadership in their institutions. Uh, Let's talk about that. While recognizing that every institution is its own special unicorn, what are your basic recommendations for investment? Well, I joked around uh, literally in the book that I expected that the presence, this is the first place they were going to turn in the book. I know you went there first. (laughs) Uh, So they'll be ready to have that conversation. The first thing I want to say is that um, it would be really helpful if you can get to people to start thinking about marketing, not as a cost or an expense, but as an investment. And the parallels here are that your CFO, who's got a, an investment manager who pays a fee, you know, if you're an institution of my size, it's, it's, you know, millions that they pay annually to manage that investment and make sure that it has a return in terms of growth, financial growth over time. In terms of facilities, if your administrative vice president is investing in the cost of a facility for, let's say, a residence hall or an auxiliary enterprise of some sort, all the upfront costs goes into building the building before there's ever revenue to pay back the debt that you borrowed, you know, to build it, right? This is the same thing. There is an investment to be made that will create value, both revenue and reputation, depending on what you're using it for, right? So it could be for enrollment. It could be to support fundraising. It could be for other kinds of things, for reputational purposes, to build favorability for the institution, to build brand loyalty among your key audiences. All of those are building value, which is the subtitle of the book, right? So getting people flip the script to get institutional leaders to think about this as an investment also implies that we are going to be held accountable for showing what that return on the investment is. And there's a a piece of the chapter on that as well. The numbers, I give you all kinds of ways to think about this. So it used to be when I was uh, kind of coming up in this world that the easy handle was percentage of total budget. And um, marketers at that that time were saying, particularly in corporate environments, that you should have three to five percent of the budget. Now, the American Marketing Association does a survey every year by sector, and they have demonstrated that in education, the percentage of total budget is 11 percent. That includes all kinds of education folks in the sector, including OPMs, online program managers, who've demonstrated in the media when you've looked at a place like a 2U or something or Southern New Hampshire University, but still nonprofit, but a big online presence. They're spending like 19, 20 percent of their budget on marketing, Um, but it's got a huge return that 
oh, performs well above that investment. We're never going to be at those points in nonprofit higher education. We're not, right? And it was shocking uh, when we started the brand st- work at American that, that 1% of the budget was going to go to this. That's a tall order for people at some institutions to defend, for a president to defend it. Your boards are going to know much quicker than the rest of the leadership um, that that's uh, low and well worth the investment. So I kind of go through, here are some ways at different kinds of data to help you think about what you might need. So there's um, research from uh, both case and from a survey of CMOs that's been done now three times that you can look at your type of institution and you can look at the mean, the minimum, the maximum, and get a sense of dollars expended uh, for your type of institution and see what realm you're in. That's just a, you know, what's in your marketing budget. Sounds easy, right? Uh, but you actually even getting what you spend on marketing across the institution could be a real challenge. And that's something you need to work with your provost and your CFO to help you gather that data because it's going to require deans to cooperate and communicators and other divisions or offices to share what they're spending. But once you do that, you can look at the total spend and then think about where it's being expended. If you go back to that percentage of budget, I would say, you know, if you think about startups, startups maybe spend one to three percent of their total budget. And if you haven't invested in marketing before, maybe that's the place to put a stake in the ground and say, here's where we should start. And here's why. And here's the data. And then work your way up after you have demonstrated some return on investment over time. And it really requires you, obligates you to identify how you're going to measure this process before you invest in it. And then report on it religiously to your leaders, to your key audiences. Make sure that you do that. And if, if something's not working, then you got to make an adjustment or you won't hold that investment. I have found, too, that that also helps with the, the buy-in as you go along when you're starting um, – to report, here's where the successes are, the, here's how this money has um, provided a sound investment for the college. Um, when you can show that over and over again, the asks become easier and easier yeah. because yeah. the institution knows, your president knows, your CFO, your CFO knows that not only are you looking for ways to advance the institution, but you're also going to have the accountability on the other end. Um, and when you're showing successes and when you're showing also the, the places that didn't work out right. uh, transparently, um, it, it becomes a nice uh, feedback loop of, of trust and, and an ability to to make those more difficult asks when you need to with yep. greater success. And, and that's not just limited to marketing. In higher ed, there are investments we, we make that don't pan out, but we've got to be good at saying, hmm, this is not working, we need to adjust, or we've got to mitigate this issue. So lastly, what should CMOs and marketing and comm departments be doing now to prepare for the evolving tech future? Well, I, I keep uh, repeating that if you don't have an enterprise CRM, Salesforce is going to love this, right? If you don't have an enterprise-wide CRM, then you really understood uh, how hamstrung you were in this environment, communicating with all of our stakeholder audiences as frequently as we do. So we're doing it all manually, trying to coordinate it, trying to anticipate it, writing it all on the fly. It's nuts, right? And a CRM helps us with that piece. Um, And so that's a form of technology that I'd really uh, encourage us to think about. I think many of us are not sophisticated enough in terms of our digital marketing and need to get better at MarTech that uh, is used to support that work. Um, I think that the whole online experience of our students is giving us information, huge information about user experience that we should be tapping through our tech tools to understand how things are going, how to make them better. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm tying data and the tools you use to gather it together. But there's, you know, the whole sort of uh, notion of MarTech technology that supports marketing work, whether it's marketing automation software, CRM, CMS, tools that help us understand the user experience and influence it over the course of uh, the student life cycle are really, really important. Okay, so as we wrap up, we always like to pivot away from higher ed. We know you are a higher ed wonk. Uh, What else are you wonky about? (laughs) Do you mean wonky? No, no, we don't want to use that word. But I am a a smart, passionate, focused, engaged advocate of 
<laughs> politics. I love politics. Even in the current environment, I would have to say. So I'm a big fan of the Constitution. Uh, I've been watching tools that our founders developed in the United States more than 200 years ago that are have a series of checks and balances that were this brilliant, brilliant design. Um, and I know that times are hard politically, but those tools are working and it's really fun to watch when you're a, a political monk. Excellent. So we're looking forward to more great conversations with higher ed thought leaders in the weeks and months to come. Terry, thank you so much for being part of our podcast. Where can our community find you online? You can find me at Higher Ed Wonk on Twitter is the main way to find me. I'm on LinkedIn. And obviously, you can come see what we're doing at Stony Brook University anytime at stonybrook.edu. And to our listeners, if you'd like to explore a topic further, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at hdotchell.com.